Greetings to all watching this video. Today we will be discussing about the folds of the dura mater. First we will see what are the meningeal layers. As you all know the three meningeal layers are dura mater, arachnoid mater and the pia mater. So uh, the dura mater has two layers the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. So this is the periosteal layer and this is the meningeal layer. The periosteal layer is towards the skull and whereas the meningeal layer is towards the brain. And in between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, mater there is a space that space is called as subdural space. So this is the subdural space. What are the contents of the subdural space? There is thin layer of capillary fluid and also veins which are on the way to drain into this dural venous sinus. So any bleeding which occurs in the subdural space, it is venous. Now there is one more space in between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. So this space is called as the subarachnoid space. It mainly consists of cerebrospinal fluid and arteries. So any uh, bleeding here, it occurs uh, it's, it is arterial. Now next we will see some of the spaces. As we have already seen two spaces that is the subdural and subarachnoid. Now we are going to see one more space which is called as the virtuo robin space. Now what is this virtuo robin space? As the artery enters and passes through the substance of the brain you are seeing the artery which is entering and passing through the substance of the brain it carries along with it a tubular prolongation so this tubular prolongation is called as perivascular space it is called as the perivascular space so as the artery enters through the substance of the brain it pulls along itself the arachnoid matter and the matter along with it subarachnoid space. Now what is the function of this virtual robin space? Mainly it gives some space for the vessel to pulsate. As you can see this perivascular space is extending up to the level of the arteriole. Usually the space is not seen but in some conditions like dementia when this perivascular space is enlarged it will be seen in the MR images otherwise it is not seen we will now go to the next slide here we will see that the dura mater which consists of an outer periosteal layer and the inner meningeal layer they both are closely in close proximation to each other except at some places where the endosteal layer of the dura mater is separated from the meningeal layer of the dura mater. At such place of separation there exists the dural venous sinus. We will also be seeing something called as folds of dura mater. Now what is this folds of dura mater? We are seeing the dura mater here, we are seeing the dura mater here and this is the brain substance. A fold of dura mater enters the brain substance and divides the brain into compartments. We will see that later. In the next slide, we will see why you should have dural fold or what is the need to have the dural fold. These dural folds divide the inner aspect of the cranial cavity into compartment inside which the brain is placed very safe and secure. So in this diagram you are seeing this is the fold of dura mater which is beautifully dividing the cranial cavity into compartments. As you can see this is the cerebrum and this is the cerebellum. So the brain is placed very safe and secure inside its compartment. So if this was not there during any rotation of the skull the brain tissue would have been damaged. So luckily we have the dural folds which divides the cranial cavity into compartments which safely secures and protects the brain. In the next slide we will see some of the osteological importance. 
uh, to study the attachments of the dural folds. Here we will see this. This is called as the sagittal sulcus. You are seeing here. This is the vault of the skull. The inner aspect of the vault of the skull. This groove is called as the sagittal sulcus. We will see the attachment of the dural folds later. So in the next slide, we will see the osteology of the skull. So in this, we can see that the uh, cranial cavity, the inner aspect of the cranial cavity is divided into three compartments. So this is the anterior uh, cranial compartment. This is the middle cranial compartment of the middle cranial fossa and this is the posterior cranial fossa. As you all can see, this is the orbital plate of the frontal bone so this is the orbital plate of the frontal bone this bone in the center that is the ethmoid bone so that is the ethmoid bone in the ethmoid bone we will see again in the next few slides you see a sharp sharp elevation there that is called as the crista galli now the blue color part of the bone which you are seeing here the butterfly shaped bone that is called as the sphenoid now, the sphenoid bone and then this part is called as the squamous part of the temporal bone and this is called as petrous part of the temporal bone and this is the occipital bone. Now, we will see the parts. So, as already discussed, this is the Crystal which is of importance to us and this is the lesser wing of sphenoid. So that is the lesser wing of sphenoid and this part is the greater wing of sphenoid. Now here you are seeing something here that is called as the anterior clenoid process. This is the body of the sphenoid or the cella tersica. Now in the middle portion this is the squamous part of the temporal bone and this is the petrous part of the temporal bone. Now this is the anterior clenoid process as already discussed. So this is the anterior clenoid process what is seen here. This is the posterior clenoid process. So anterior clenoid process and the posterior clenoid process. In between the posterior clenoid process, there is something called as dorsum cellae. In between the anterior clenoid process, there is tuberculum cellae. We will see the tuberculum cellae. The remaining osteology we will see as and when we require. So, again, we will be seeing the revision of osteology. So, as already discussed, crista galli. You all know the crista galli. So, this piece of bone here is called as the crista galli. Then we will see the tuberculum cellae. So, this is the tuberculum cellae. We will see the dorsum cellae. Where is dorsum cellae present? It is present in between the posterior clenoid process. Then we will see internal occipital protuberance. We will discuss that. So, internal occipital crest. What is internal occipital crest? Extending from the internal occipital protuberance till the foramen magnum. This is the internal occipital crest. So, as already discussed, you know the internal occipital protuberance. Then, petrous part of temporal bone. You all know that this is the petrous part of the temporal bone. Now, next we will see again as discussed anterior clenoid process so this is the anterior clenoid process and this is the posterior clenoid process i will show the posterior clenoid process once again uh, this is the posterior clenoid process we will go to the next slide uh, we will see the folds of dura mater the folds of dura mater are fox cerebri so we have the Fox cerebri, tentorium cerebelli, fox cerebelli, and diaphragma cellae. The names are very easy to remember, nothing to uh, by heart. Fox, F A L X, fox means sickle. So, fox means sickle shaped. Cerebri means it is present in between the two cerebrum, that is why it is called as fox 
cerebri. We will go to the next one that is tentorium cerebelli. Tentorium means tent shaped. It looks like a tent that is why it is called as tentorium and cerebelli because it is present above the cerebellum. Now we will see fox cerebelli as you already know. Fox means sickle. Cerebelli means it is present in between the cerebellum. Next we will see the diaphragma cellae. So diaphragma cellae, it covers the cella tersica. So uh, we will see about it later. Now we will go to the next slide in which we will be seeing about each dural fold separately. So now we will study about the fox cerebri. As you all can see, fox means sickle shaped. If you see here, this layer is the fox cerebri. So that layer is the fox cerebri which is sickle shaped. That is why it's called fox cerebri. This has a pointed anterior end and a broad posterior end. And it has a convex upper margin. Sorry. It has, I will show it once again. It has a pointed anterior end and broad posterior end. It has a convex upper margin and concave inner margin as you all know it is present in between the cerebrum that is why it is called as fox cerebri now this pointed anterior end is attached to the crista galli which we discussed just few minutes back so the pointed anterior end is attached to the crista galli now the broad posterior end is attached to a fold that is called as Tentorium cerebelli. Tentorium means tent shaped. So the anterior end of the fox cerebri, anterior end of the fox cerebri is attached to the crista galli, and the posterior end of the fox cerebri is attached to the upper aspect or the upper surface of the tentorium cerebelli. Now we have the convex upper margin like this which is attached to the sagittal sulcus. We already discussed it. Then we have a free concave margin. Now we will study what are the sinuses present in relation to these folds. Sinuses are the dural venous sinuses which are present in between where the uh, two layer of the dura mater separated there you will have the sinus so in relation to the fox cerebri the sinuses are superior sagittal sinus can you see this blue sinus here so in the outer convex margin the superior sagittal sinus is present in the free inner concave margin in the posterior two-third is present inferior sagittal sinus so in the superior part outer convex margin the sinus present is superior sagittal sinus in the posterior two-third of the inferior free part which is concave what sinus is present is the inferior sagittal sinus at the attachment of the fox cerebri with the tentorium cerebelli there is a sinus present that sinus is called as straight sinus so this sinus which is present between the attach, uh, attachment of the fox cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli is the straight sinus. Having learned about the fox cerebri, we will next move on to the next slide in which we will be seeing the fox cerebri. As already discussed, this is a sickle shaped fold of dura mater which is present in between the cerebrum that is why it is called as fox cerebri you can appreciate here this is the fox cerebri it has an anterior end which as you know is attached to the crista galli and the posterior end will be attached to the upper surface of the tentorium cerebelli outer convex margin and which is attached to the sagittal sulcus of the vault of the skull and the inner free concave margin so this is about the fox cerebri. Now very quickly the sinus present in the outer convex margin is superior sagittal sinus. In the inner concave margin is inferior sagittal sinus. Now we will go to the next slide. So 
So far we have finished one dural fold that is the fox cerebri. We have finished this attachment, the anterior end, posterior end and all those things. Now we will see the tentorium cerebelli. As already discussed, tentorium means tent shaped. Why has this fold of duramata got a tent shape? It's because we already discussed that the fox cerebri is attaching to the upper surface of tentorium cerebelli. Because of this attachment, because of the attachment of the fox cerebri to the tentorium cerebelli, it pulls the tentorium cerebelli in such a way that it looks like a tent. Underneath is present the cerebellum. So, this is the tentorium cerebelli. We will next see. Yes. So, this tentorium cerebelli, it divides the intracranial cavity into compartment, namely supratentorial and intratentorial compartment. So, this part above will be the supratentorial compartment and the part inside the tentorium cerebelli is the intratentorial compartment. Now we will see about the attachment of the tentorium cerebelli. So yes we will see the attachment of the tentorium cerebelli. Before that this uh, slide is to show the supratentorial and the intratentorial compartment as already discussed. You can see here that is the tentorium sorry. So this is the tentorium cerebelli which is dividing the upper compartment into a supratentorial compartment and intratentorial compartment. You all can see that in the supratentorial compartment cerebrum is present and in the intratentorial compartment cerebellum is present. Now we can see the next slide here again this image is to show that this is the supratentorial compartment having the cerebrum and this is the intratentorial compartment having the cerebellum. Now we will go to the next slide to see the attachment of the tentorium cerebelli. So this tentorium cerebelli has free part and an attached part. What you are seeing in this diagram this is the free part or the free margin of the tentorium cerebelli. What you are seeing here that is the attached margin of the tentorium cerebelli. To see here this is the attached margin of tentorium cerebelli and as you already know this is the free margin of the tentorium cerebelli. Now we will see what is the attachment. To which part the bone it is attached. Now the free margin of the tentorium cerebelli if you observe it is like U shaped. It is U shaped. The ends of this free portion is attached to the anterior clinoid process which you already know. So the free portion of the tentorium cerebelli is attached to from one anterior clinoid process to another anterior clinoid process. The U-shaped space in between is called as the tentorial notch. So, this part is called as the tentorial notch which mainly has the midbrain. So, having seen the free part, having seen the free part of the tentorium cerebelli, we will now see the attached margin of the tentorium cerebelli. So, uh, once again here, I will be showing the free margin of the tentorium cerebellar. You can see here, which is attached from anterior clinoid process of one side to the anterior clinoid process of other side. So, this U-shaped form inside aspect is called as tentorial notch in which midbrain will be present. Now, we will see attached part of the tentorium cerebelli. So, the attached part mainly is this part as you already know. Let us now see the attachment of tentorium cerebelli. So, this portion which is opposite. 
to the external occipital protuberance on the inner side this portion is called as internal occipital protuberance you can see here a sulcus on both the side which is called as transverse sulcus now you will see something here that is called as petrous part of temporal bone you will also see something which is the posterior clinoid process now we will see the attachment of attached portion of tentorium cerebelli so it is the internal occipital protuberance it is the transverse sulcus and it is the superior part uh, sorry the petrous part of the temporal bone and then to the posterior clinoid process so that is the attached portion of the tentorium cerebelli so tentorium cerebelli has two parts that is the free part which is u shaped and the attached part so having known this next we will see what are the sinuses present in relation to this tentorium cerebelli we already saw that in fox cerebri we had superior sagittal sinus inferior sagittal sinus and also the straight sinus now we will see the sinuses present in uh, relation to the tentorium cerebelli here as you know that this is a transverse sulcus right where the attached margin of tentorium cerebelli is attached now to this transverse sulcus runs the transverse sinus now petrous part of the temporal bone runs superior petrosal sinus very simple so the two sinuses present in relation to the tentorium cerebelli are in the transverse sulcus that is the transverse sinus in petrous part of the temporal bone superior petrosal sinus so these are the two sinus we can see here one more sinus which is the straight sinus so straight sinus was present at the junction of the fox cerebri with the tentorium cerebelli so this was the straight sinus having studied this we will go to the next slide we in which we have already discussed where is the transverse sinus and where is the superior petrosal sinus so this is the transverse sinus and this is the superior petrosal sinus we will now go to the next slide yes in this we will see something called as oculomotor trigone and meckel's cape first we will see what is this oculomotor trigone now this oculomotor trigone if you observe here carefully as you already know tentorium as the free part and the fixed part you know that the free margin or the free part is attached to the anterior clinoid process and the fixed part is attached to the posterior clinoid process so having said that now we will see that in between the free portion and the attached portion of tentorium cerebelli there is a triangular triangular region present that is called as oculomotor trigone i will repeat it once again so we know that the free portion of the tentorium cerebelli is attached to the anterior clinoid process and the fixed portion is attached to the posterior clinoid process if you observe carefully here in between the free and the fixed part there is a triangle shaped area so that is called as oculomotor trigone what is the importance of this oculomotor trigone the third cranial nerve as the name suggest oculomotor nerve and the fourth cranial nerve or the trochlear nerve will pierce this oculomotor trigone and come out so it becomes easy to identify them so that was about the oculomotor trigone which means which is a triangular shaped area in between the free portion and the attached portion so in between the free portion of the tentorium cerebelli and the attached portion of the tentorium cerebelli now we will see about the meckel's cave what is this meckel's cave so we know the attached portion of the tentorium cerebelli now as the attached portion of the tentorium cerebelli is proceeding towards the petrous part of the temporal bone it sends a layer to cover 
in front of the petrous part of the temporal bone. So this will be called as the Meckel's cave. If you remove this portion of the tentorium cerebelli, you will be seeing the trigeminal ganglion there. So that is the Meckel's cave. We will discuss that once again. So we were, sorry, we were discussing about the Meckel's cave. So what is the Meckel's cave? The attached portion. So the Meckel's cave is nothing but the attached portion of the tentorium cerebelli so that is the attached portion of tentorium cerebelli as it proceeds towards the petrous part of the temporal bone it will send one layer of extension to cover in front of the petrous part of the temporal bone it covers a ganglion that is the trigeminal ganglion so if you remove that layer of the uh, attached margin of tentorium cerebelli you will get the trigeminal ganglion which is this so that is about the Meckel's cave now we will see the next slide so in this slide once again you have the oculomotor trigon which is very beautifully seen can you all see this triangular shaped area here so that is the oculomotor trigon in which the third cranial oculomotor and fourth cranial or the trochlear nerve will come out and this is the region of the Meckel's cave if you remove that you will get the trigeminal ganglion now next we will see uh, so so far what we have studied is we have studied about the fax cerebri so what and all we have studied we have studied about the fax cerebri its attachment sinuses present with relation to it and we have studied tentorium cerebelli its attachment we know that it has two parts that is the free margin and the attached margin and sinuses present in relation to that now and we have also seen the oculomotor trigon and the meckel's cave so far now we will see another fold of dura mater which is called as diaphragma cellae we will see its attachment if you observe here the layer of the, the fold of dura mater which covers the cella tersica that is called as diaphragma cellae. They by it covers the underlying gland which is the pituitary gland. So the diaphragma cellae it will roof the cella tersica as you all can see here it is roofing the cella tersica and if you observe there is a small depression here which is for the stalk of the um, uh, pituitary gland now we will see the attachment we will see the attachment of this diaphragma cellae so above you have tuberculum cellae behind there is dorsum cellae above or in front is tuberculum cellae behind is the dorsum cellae now uh, in the center there is stock of stock for pituitary gland now, what are the sinus which is present in relation to it? We have anterior intercavernous sinus, posterior intercavernous sinus, which will connect the cavernous sinus which is present in this region. So, that was about the diaphragma cellae, which is very simple. Next, yes, we already know that what is it pierced by diaphragma cellae? You already know that it is pierced by stalk, a local thing which is present here. Uh, of the pituitary gland sinus present you also know you have the anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus so next we will see a last fold which is called as fox cerebelli so far we saw fox cerebri tentorium cerebelli and diaphragma cellae now we will see fox cerebelli so this fox cerebelli again as the name says as the name says, Fox means sickle, cerebellum means it is present in between the cerebellum. Now, this is the Fox cerebelli. So, that is the Fox cerebelli. If you see that, it is sickle shaped. What are the presenting parts? The Fox cerebelli is sickle shaped. It has the base which is attached to the inferior margin of the tentorium cerebelli. It has the apex. So, this is the apex which is present, uh, which is almost near the posterior cerebellar notch because cerebellum will be present here. Posterior cerebellar notch, sorry, 
uh, cerebellum will be present here. So the apex is directed to the posterior cerebellar notch which will be present here posterior cerebellar notch. Now uh, it is present in the internal occipital crest it is present from here and the um, uh, I mean it is directed towards the foramen magnum. Now to quickly revise this so fox cerebella it is a sickle shaped fold of dura mater the base is attached to the under surface of the tentorium cerebelli apex is towards the posterior cerebellar notch. So this largest sinus which is called as occipital sinus so quick revision of sinus superior sagittal sinus posterior two third inferior sagittal sinus straight sinus transverse sinus will come here occipital sinus in the fox cerebelli so next again this is to show the fox cerebelli this image was to show the fox cerebelli which is present in between the cerebellum now next we will see the blood supply of the dura mater as we already know that the inner aspect of the cranial cavity is divided into anterior middle and the posterior cranial fossa we will first study the blood supply of the anterior cranial fossa it is by the many ethmoidal branch if you can see here you have the meningeal branch of the anterior and posterior ethmoidal artery which is in turn a branch of ophthalmic artery so anterior cranial fossa is supplied by ophthalmic arteries branches ophthalmic arteries branches which are meningeal branches of anterior ethmoidal and meningeal branches of posterior ethmoidal arteries so anterior cranial fossa is done now we will see the blood supply of the middle cranial fossa middle cranial fossa's blood supply is mainly by the maxillary artery so maxillary arteries middle meningeal artery the meningeal branch of the middle meningeal artery and accessory meningeal artery which is present here they supply the middle cranial fossa so they supply the middle cranial fossa so blood supply of middle cranial fossa is by middle meningeal and accessory meningeal artery which is branch of the maxillary artery now next we will see that middle cranial fossa is also supplied by it is supplied by the recurrent meningeal branch of the lacrimal artery so this is the recurrent meningeal branch of the lacrimal artery next middle cranial fossa is also supplied by the meningeal branch of the internal carotid artery and the ascending pharyngeal artery so that was about the middle cranial fossa now we will see the blood supply of the posterior cranial fossa it is mainly by meningeal branches of ascending pharyngeal artery meningeal branches of the vertebral artery meningeal branches of the occipital artery next we will see the nerve supply the nerve supply is uh, mainly sensory through the trigeminal nerve and its branches so next we will see yes the anterior cranial fossa it is supplied by the ethmoidal anterior and the posterior ethmoidal nerve which is in turn a branch of ophthalmic nerve so ophthalmic nerves anterior ethmoidal nerve and posterior ethmoidal nerve will supply the anterior cranial fossa the middle cranial fossa will be supplied by meningeal branches of the maxillary nerve whereas the posterior cranial fossa will be supplied by meningeal branches of the vagus nerve in the next slide we will see what is the difference between the spinal dura and the cranial dura you already know that in the cranial dura the dura mater were two layers so the dura mater were two layers the outer periosteal layer inner meningeal layer but in spinal dura you have only one layer okay so we will see what is that layer now as already discussed in the cranial cavity you have two layer the outer periosteal and the inner meningeal the periosteal layer will end at the margin of the foramen magnum it will end at the margin of the foramen magnum and only the meningeal layer of the dura mater will enter into the spinal uh, space 
that is a vertebral space so in this uh, spinal duroid is mainly of one layer now this is the uh, um, the vertebrae the vertebrae they have their own periosteum if you can see here the vertebrae they have their own periosteum they will have their own periosteum and the prolongation of the meningeal layer of the dura mater into the spinal cavity and you also can see one space here that is called as the epidural space so this space here in between the periosteum of the vertebral bones and the dura mater of the spinal uh, cavity there's a space present there that is called as the epidural space spinal anesthesia can be uh, sorry epidural anesthesia can be given here for childless uh, sorry painless birth now so after this we will be going to the next slide oh sorry that is about the uh, this is the last slide now there's one more thing the extra dural hemorrhage there's something called as extra dural hemorrhage we know that in the cranial uh, cavity dura mater is two layer the outer uh, periosteal layer and the inner meningeal layer in cranial dura mater there is no extra dural space because the outer periosteal layer is uh, itself the endosteum of the skull now if there's any fracture of the skull what happens is the meningeal vessels which are present in between the skull and the outer periosteum of the dura mater they are torn and when they bleed there occurs extra dural hemorrhage so there is no extra dural space in the cranial cavity but when bleeding occurs in such manner it is called as extra dural hemorrhage thank you for watching